Hello everyone, it's Dr. Locklear here, and today we're going to be talking about the concept of nutrition. This is module number 14, and it starts on page 983 in your Pearson text. So what are the learning outcomes? We're going to analyze the physiology of nutrition, so we're going to look at some different uh, pieces related to minerals and um, proteins and fats and lipids and things that we all have to have to survive. Uh, differentiate among the alterations in nutrition. Outline the relationship between nutrition and other concepts. Explain the promotion of healthy nutrition because as a nurse you're going to have to teach uh, patients the concept of healthy nutrition, especially if you're working with a diabetic or a cardiac patient who's on a low salt diet. Uh, we really ha need to have a good knowledge of nutrition for our patients. Differentiate among common assessment procedures and tests that are used when we evaluate nutritional status. Uh, is the patient getting enough protein? Do they have a, a normal body mass index? And so we'll look at some of the tools that they use. Analyze independent interventions nurses can implement for patients with alteration. So what kind of interventions can we use when we're educating patients about good nutrition? We're going to look at the collaborative therapies that the interprofessional team uses, and we're going to differentiate considerations related to the care of patients with alterations in nutrition throughout the lifespan, so from the infant on to the oldest person. So let's get started. So what is nutrition? Nutrition is where food intake is uh, something we do on a daily basis. It is considered enjoyable and uh, it contributes to the emotional stability of individuals by providing opportunities for social interaction and communication. We know a lot of times that events are often held uh, with uh, certain types of food. A lot of people like to go to, to social events just because of the food. And so you, you have an opportunity to, um, you know, enjoy some things that you may never eat that you can't cook at home. Uh, but food is a way of bringing us together. Um, it helps us emotionally. Some people eat when they're nervous or uh, stressed. Um, sometimes that's a bad thing, though, because we can overeat. Nutrition is the science of the intake of nutrients and their actions in body functioning. So how do these nutrients function in our body? What are their roles? Nutrition intake is essential to ongoing health and physical well-being. And again, it is enjoyable. Uh, it helps us um, feel better when we maintain a healthy diet. We uh, feel healthy. Um, we uh, use food to give us energy and stamina and help, you know, keep our, our cognitive status clear. And so all these minerals and nutrients uh, have a role in that. You have a YouTube video, uh, you can watch that and I, I will be showing that in class as well. So normal nutrition. Hunger is a stimulus that encourages individuals to eliminate this feeling by eating. So when we get hungry, when our stomach gets empty, we get hungry. Theory suggests that hunger is a response to chemical mediators in the hypothalamus that promote food-seeking behaviors. And so like when our blood sugar starts to drop, our body, you may start to feel hungry and our body's telling us we need more food. Or when you become dehydrated, you may get a severe headache. If you ever have a severe headache, go drink some water and see if that'll help because sometimes headaches are related to dehydration. However, the food choices that individuals make determine whether their nutritional intake is appropriate to meet their body's various needs and whether what we ingest contributes to disease. So like if we eat too much sugar and we're diabetic, it's going to make our blood sugars higher. If we eat too much salt and we have cardiac problems, we're going to retain fluid. It's going to make our blood pressure go up. And if we just overeat, it's going to make our weight, uh, 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 make us become overweight and obese, which can lead to all kinds of problems. And we'll talk about that in the obesity chapter. 
And so when we look at food choices, uh, is this a contributing factor to wellness and to illness? Um, so the, you know, based on our food choices, um, is it healthy for us or is it unhealthy for us? Individuals base food choices on a number of factors. So let's look at table 14-1 on page 984. And so we base it on taste. How does it taste? And as we get older, our taste does change. How does it smell? Does it smell good? Does it have a great aroma? What are our habits? Some people uh, eat with their fingers. Some people use a spoon. My husband always eats with a spoon. He never eats with a fork. Um, is the food convenient? Um, is it available? Um, some people have food insecurity, which means they don't have enough food. Um, we have a big issue with food insecurity in the United States and in the world. Packaging, is it easy to read the labels? Does the packaging make it more appealing? Emotion, are you eating with others uh, because it's a social event? Are you eating unconsciously because it makes you have pleasure or you're lonely or depressed? Body image. Body image may affect choices that promote appropriate weight. Some people eat very little because they're anorexic and they're very conscious about uh, gaining weight and they don't want to gain weight. Anorexia is, is uh, a disease that is very difficult to deal with. It's very emotional based disease. Health. Some foods may meet specific health needs. Um, so, you know, if you're a diabetic or a cardiac patient or a renal patient, you've got kidney problems and you're on dialysis, you really have to watch what you eat with dialysis patients. Uh, cultural. Uh, individuals may prefer foods from their country. So you may have a patient uh, that's from a different country and they don't like the food that's being served. So we have to work with dietary to get um, them the things that they need. A food desert is any area of population where it is difficult to find good quality, affordable fresh fruits, vegetables, and whole grains. In urban areas, a food desert is generally recognized as any populated area more than one mile from a grocery store that sells fresh fruits and vegetables. In rural areas, the distance is generally more than 10 miles. Distance and affordability greatly affect food choices. And as we know right now, and we are dealing with an increase in the cost of food. We're having issues with our food being able to be delivered to the grocery stores. Uh, it is uh, it's causing, you know, the cost of food to go up. Uh, what used to be $10 for a bag of chicken wings is now almost $20. And so, you know, we're seeing this uh, uh, problem with distribution and it is affecting our ability to get quality food at a, a reasonable price. Food security, uh, this is where the members of the household had resources uh, just sufficient to attain appropriate quantities and variety of food. So when you have food security, you have enough to get by. When you have food insecurity, you have no consistent access to sufficient nutritious foods. Patients may go hungry to ensure that their children have adequate food to eat. According to the Feeding America campaign, 15.3 million people or children experience food insecurity. So we know a lot of our children only get food when they're at school. And so a lot of the schools have pitched in and they're sending home backpack meals. And so the, the, the child will have food when they go home for the weekend. Food insecurity among children may be higher in the summertime because they're not in school. And so where do they get their food from? Are there distribution banks? And do they have the ability to even get to the distribution banks? Food inse uh, insecurity is particularly prevalent among certain um, uh, ethnic groups. And they list here like African-Americans and aging veterans. Um, you know, and, and these things can be uh, because of numerous factors, inability to have access to food, um, inability to be able to buy food. And again, like I said, food is getting more and more costly each day.
So food choices, uh, satiety, what does satiety mean? Satiety is the feeling of fullness and satisfaction that you should uh, feel when you're um, uh, eating and it carries you over to the next meal. It keeps you from eating and eating and eating. So in other words, when you have satiety, you've eaten enough, your stomach feels full and your uh, brain says, that's enough. I can't eat anymore. Results of studies suggest that satiety was significantly increased when protein replaced fat in meals containing the same number of calories. Whole grains may function in a similar manner. So think about this. You ever eaten foods that after you eat it, you still feel hungry? Or you eat certain foods and you just fill up really fast. It doesn't take a lot to fill you up. So that's what it's talking about here. Food choices that increase satiety may be beneficial when considering the health risks associated with obesity and the importance of decreasing caloric intake. So if you're dealing with obesity, you want to eat those kinds of foods that will fill you up faster, such as high proteins, those uh, grains and things like that. Food safety. Each year in the United States, over 48 million people succumb to foodborne illnesses. Many of these illnesses result in only minor discomfort, such as nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Some require hospitalization. I've had food poisoning twice, and it is no fun. That was probably one of the sickest moments in my life. I, I, I got um, food poisoning from eggs in two different restaurants, and it was, it was a, not a good feeling. I was in the hospital like five days both times. Over 31 known pathogens have been linked to illnesses, and here's some of the most common. The norovirus, salmonella, E. coli, and the campylobacter. Some foods, especially fish, shark, swordfish, king mackerel, tilefish, contain mercury that should be considered harmful, especially in pregnant women. And so when you're educating your pregnant moms, we need to definitely talk to them about making sure that they uh, don't eat some of these fish products. So what is nutritional health and nutritional status? Nutritional health is defined as the physical result of the balance between nutrient intake and nutritional requirements. Patients who consume adequate nutrition to meet their individual needs and avoid habitual excesses and insufficiencies would be considered to be in good nutritional health. Any number of factors can impair nutritional health. For example, individuals who consume excess saturated fats, and we know that the fats are one of the things that give the food its flavor, so that's why people like to eat them so much. Um, they may be considered to have poor nutritional health intake due to overnutrition. They're eating too much. There is also a predictable relationship between consuming sweets, snacks, and soft drinks during pregnancy and excessive weight gain. You don't want to gain too much weight during pregnancy because it can lead to gestational diabetes and uh, lead to uh, uh, fluid volume overload as well. And mom can go into what's called preeclampsia, and you'll learn about that in NUR 113. People who consume less than the required amount of folic acid during pregnancy may replace their unborn may place their unborn child at risk for certain defects such as neurotube defects and that means that um, uh, the end of the spinal column uh, doesn't develop correctly and the child will have some major issues from that folic acid is very important during pregnancy and it's found in just eat a normal healthy diet um, you will get what you need, but now during pregnancy, you may have to take supplements. Uh, the objectives of the federal government's plan, Healthy People 2020, and there's also out now Healthy People 2030 uh, goals. Uh, they address nutritional intake and include promotion of health and reduction of the risk of developing chronic diseases by encouraging Americans to consume healthy diets. Emphasis is on modifying individual behavior patterns and habits and creating policies that will help support these behaviors. And so here's some of the things that they're looking at. Consume a variety of nutrient-dense foods within and across the food groups. And we're going to talk about my plate, and it'll show you the portions on my plate that we should have each of these food groups. Uh, whole grains, 
fruits and vegetables, low fat or fat free milk or milk products, and lean meats. So you want to eat meats that doesn't have a lot of fat content, um, uh, skinless chicken, uh, turkey, um, uh, red meats are okay, but only in moderation. You, those would be the ones that you don't want to eat a whole lot of are the red meats because they're higher in saturated fats. But we do have to have meat because of the protein. Limit the intake of saturated fats and trans fats, cholesterol, added sugars, salt, and alcohol. Limit caloric intake to meet caloric needs. Um, so remember, it is best to eat high protein vegetables and fruits than a bunch of rice and potatoes and bread and all the stuff that tastes really good. Um, but you can season food and make it taste uh, pretty good. Uh, I know I cook a lot with olive oil and because my heart, my husband's a cardiac patient and I cook a lot with um, Swanson's chicken broth and I use the low sodium brand. Um, increase the number of fruits and vegetables in your diet and uh, and especially in the diets of children uh, over two years older. Reduce obesity. So, you know, limit your caloric intake. Stay away from the sweets. And that's really hard because, you know, I'm like you all. I love my sweets. And I really have to be careful uh, the amount of sweets that I eat. Um, so we can reduce obesity by exercising, getting out and walking. Walking is one of the best exercises that, that you can do. Uh, but you have to do it on a pretty much a daily basis for about 30 minutes. So reduce those calories, eat a healthy diet. So what are some of the different diets? So we have some uh, vegetarian diets. So you have the lacto-vegetarian diet. Um, this is where they eat milk, cheese, dairy foods, but avoid meat, fish, poultry, and eggs. The lacto-vegetarian diet includes eggs and the vegan eats only foods of plant origin. Some plans will allow for the inclusion of uh, fish. And so, um, uh, so usually on your um, uh, vegan diets, they usually don't eat any type of meat on these diets. Um, vegan diet plans can lead to deficiencies in calcium, omega-3 fatty acids, iron, zinc, and B12. The lack of B12 can lead to development of pernicious anemia, uh, and that can cause some neurological uh, damage. Uh, these patients um, <clears throat> should uh, include a daily source of vitamin B12, such as fortified breakfast cereals, but not the high sugar cereals, okay? Um, uh, like grain cereals, Cheerios, they're one of the best. Um, all vegetarians should ensure they get adequate amounts of calcium, iron, zinc, and vitamin D through foods such as tofu, lentils, and Swiss chard. Uh, to facilitate the absorption and intake of iron into the body, patients should al also consume adequate amounts of vitamin C as well. <clears throat> patients may experience food allergies or food intolerance. Food allergies can manifest as urticaria, and that's skin rashes, and you're um, having hives, and hives and itching. Angioedema, this is swelling around the eyes and in the face. Rhinoconjunctivitis, again, uh, watery drainage from the eyes and uh, irritation to the eyes. Asthma, which can be very um, uh, detrimental and life-threatening. If you have an asthma attack and start closing up, then uh, our oxygenation is affected. Gastrointestinal disorders and anaphylaxis. Anaphylaxis is, is deadly, and a lot of children are allergic to peanuts. Um, they can't have uh, those peanuts in any type of food. Uh, children are allergic to milk products. And so we have to know these things, you know, um, when we're working with them in our facilities. Say you're a school nurse one day and you need to know this about the child. Um, examples of food intolerance include lactose and gluten. Lactose is the sugar found in milk and milk products. Lactose intolerance is caused by deficiency of the enzyme lactase 
which is produced by the cells lining the small intestine and results in distressing the GI symptoms. And so you'll have nausea, abdominal pain, and diarrhea. Lactose um, intolerance can cause the stomach to be bloated and you have uh, 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 just a feeling of feeling seep to your stomach. Um, and it causes um, malabsorption of the nutrients that you need as well. And so gluten intolerance is also referred to as celiac disease. It says the gluten is a protein found in foods made with wheat, rye, or barley. It causes inflammation and edema in the bowel, which leads to interruption in the absorption of some key nutrients. Symptoms include diarrhea, weight loss, bloating, nausea, and vomiting. It can manifest systematically with anemia, osteoporosis, and a rash. Gluten intolerance in children also manifests in short statue and iron deficiency anemia because these children are not able to absorb the nutrients that they need, and so it hinders their growth, really affects their growth. Um, symptoms can be significantly reduced and in some cases eliminated by reducing consumption of foods that contain gluten, such as processed flour, potato, to tortilla chips, crackers, soups, breads, and it lists a, a variety of things there for you. Food security affects nutritional status. Adults with food insecurity report poor quality of life and conditions such as weight loss, compromised immune systems, and undiagnosed diabetes. Children who lack food security are often underweight or experience wasting syndrome, growth defects, rickets, and tooth decay. Children who are hungry are often very irritable and they're, they have behavior problems in school because they cannot pay attention because they're hungry. And so schools are doing a great job in providing uh, foods for um, the morning time and lunches and again sending food home with these kids. My daughter's a school teacher and she makes sure that she has food for her kids for something when they get to school every day. And, and you know, that's, that's, it, it's just sad that we, um, are, we see that, um, but it's good that schools are kicking in and trying to help these kids from the families that just can't afford to, you know, provide what they need. So let's talk about nutrients. Nutrients are substances found in food that the body needs for health and growth, as well as for maintenance and repair. Uh, to eat a balanced and appropriate diet, experts suggest the inclusion of foods that are nutrient dense. Nutrient density refers to the ratio of good nutrients to the calories a food contains. The most nutrient dense foods contain abundance of vitamins, minerals, fiber, and other key nutrients with a decreased amount of calories. At the negative end of the nutrient density scales are foods such as candy, it's full of calories and it causes tooth decay. For example, my grandson is five years old and his two back teeth on the top and the bottom are already decayed because they were eating vitamins every day uh, that were gummies and they liked the little gummy snacks. And the dentist told my daughter not to give them any more gummies because they're just full of sugar and they stick to the teeth. And so it causes rapid tooth decay. The major nutrients are carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, which are fats, vitamins, minerals, and water. We, our body's made up of 65 to 70% of water. So we need water to keep our cells hydrated. Uh, carbohydrates, um, nutrients are classified according to the work in the body. Carbohydrates, proteins, and fats supply energy and are termed macronutrients because the body needs them in large amounts to maintain health and well-being and energy. Vitamins and minerals are considered micronutrients because they're needed in smaller amounts. This does not mean that their role is any less. Water is an essential nu nutrient and we, we, ha we cannot survive without water. You can survive without food way longer than you can without water. Adequate water intake contributes to fluid balance. It plays an important role in nerve and muscle functioning and in the transport of nutrients to all body systems. The USDA publishes the dietary guides for uh, Americans every three years. They include recommended intake for sodium, moderation of alcohol use, safety and preparing meals, and age-specific nutrients. 
Many organizations provide information regarding suggested nutrient intake and a healthy diet. Dietary reference intakes developed by the Institute of Medicine provide a standard for identifying needed amounts of nutrient. The USDA's My Plate outlines suggested food intake by food groups, bread, meats, the, the five food groups, fruits, vegetables, grains, proteins, and dairy foods. And we definitely need those in, um, in a certain uh, amount. We need more proteins and fruits and vegetables. We've got to have a little bit of carbohydrates, but we don't um, need as much carbohydrates as we do the proteins and the vegetables. Your vegetables uh, have lots of nutrients in them, and they're uh, uh, nutrients that help build those cells. And so here's a picture of the my plate. So you can see protein 20%, fruits 10, grains 30, and vegetables uh, 40%. So carbs, what are carbohydrates? Organic compounds of food that supply energy in the form of calories in the body. Adult men require more calories because their body mass index is, is wider than women. With the suggested, uh, they have more muscle mass than women is what I'm trying to say. Adult men require more calories because, um, uh, like again, their uh, muscle mass index is more than women. Uh, suggest 24 to 3,000 calories per day. And for women, 1,600 to 24 calories per day. Now, that may increase if you're pregnant. Now, caloric needs generally decrease as a result of decrease in metabolism, uh, usually around the age of 50. The primary sources of carbohydrates, plant foods. They contain sugars and starches. The simple sugars are monosaccharides, are glucose, fructose, and galactose, quickly absorbed into the bloodstream. The disaccharides are sucrose, lactose, maltose. These are found in milk, sugar cane, sugar beets, honey, and fruits. The polysaccharides are complex carbohydrates and found in grains, legumes, and root vegetables. Uh, the polysaccharides break down more slowly than the monosaccharides, and they supply energy for longer periods. Dietary fiber is a polysaccharide carbohydrate and contributes to disease prevention, especially in the GI tract, because in the GI tract, that's where all our food goes. And we're eating this food that's got bacteria in it, so our GI tract has to be intact enough to help um, um, kill this bacteria so it doesn't infect our body. Um, the kilocalorie is a unit that represents the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of one kilogram of water by one degree Celsius. It is used to indicate the energy producing ability of nutrients. Carbohydrates supply four kilogram, kilo, kilocalories per gram. The minimum necessary daily carbohydrate intake is unknown, but it's recommended at 125 to 175 grams. Carbohydrates are not stored in the body in significant amounts. Individuals must eat them throughout the day. When they are eaten in excess, the body converts them to excess glucose to glycogen or fat. So in other words, we gain weight if we eat too much of this stuff. Glycogen is stored in the liver and muscles, so you can have a fatty liver. And that's not good because that can inhibit liver function and lead to cirrhosis of the liver. Excess intake of carbohydrates over time results in obesity, dental caries, and elevated triglycerides, which can lead to plaque buildup and cardiac problems such as heart attack. Insufficient intake of carbohydrates over a period of time leads to tissue wasting from protein breakdown and metabolic acidosis from an excess in ketones. Because when your body doesn't have enough fat, it'll start breaking down the muscle. And when it breaks down the muscle, you will lose ketones. And that's how we know the muscle is being broke down. And we don't want to break down the muscle. Uh, we, we want our body to use the fat stores that it has. So what are lipids? These are their fats. They're substances that dissolve in alcohol, but not in water. They contain carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen and serve as secondary sources of fuel for the body. They're divided in three categories, and you all should know this, triglycerides, phospholipids, and steroids. Most individuals use the term fats instead of lipids. 
They provide most of the energy for the body, supplying nine kilocalories per gram of food. Fat is also the storage form of excess energy intake from the food we eat. So if we eat too many fats, we're, we're, we've got an excess and we're going to be overweight. In addition to supplying energy, fat is useful in body protection. Fat surrounds vital organs. It protects portions of the skeleton from shock and aids in insulation and temperature. Fat also aids in absorption of fat-soluble vitamins and assists in the feeling of satiety. Like I said, the fats in the foods make the food taste better. And so if you've got some fat in your diet, you're going to fill up faster. So if you're eating fats and, and proteins, uh, say you eat a piece of red steak meat, which is my favorite, by the way, um, you will fill up faster than if you eat something that don't have a high protein and fat content. Saturated fats contain all the material they're capable of holding. They hold all the hydrogen ions they can. Fats that do not contain all of the material they are capable of holding, thus they have a place where hydrogen ions are missing, are unsaturated fats. If only one set place is missing, the fat is termed monounsaturated. If two or more are missing, the fat is termed polyunsaturated. Research suggests that unsaturated fats are more heart healthy and that consumption of some unsaturated fats such as olive oil can even protect the heart. So again, I use a lot of olive oil. Some fat is essential for digestion, absorption, and transportation of fat-soluble vitamins such as A, D, E, and K. In this sense, essential means that the body cannot make the nutrient, so it must be ingested. Fat also contains the essential uh, uh, fatty acids, linoleic and linoleic acid. The primary role of these two acids in the body is the formation of prostaglandins. Prostaglandins are responsible for muscle activity, blood vessel response, blood clotting, and the inflammatory response. Other functions of fats in the body are to provide a storage form of energy, padding, insulation, and cell membrane integrity. Two other groups of fats also play a role in the body, uh, phospholipids and sterols. These phospholipids play a role in fat, fat transport. Sterols, such as cholesterol, provide the bile necessary for digestion, but excessive cholesterol plays a significant role in building up plaque in the vessels, therefore leading to um, uh, cardiac problems with perfusion, because if my vessels are blocked, my, uh, my body, my, my, um, I'm going to be susceptible to clots, and then I'm going to have a heart attack, and the plaque can break off and cause a clot. So what are proteins? These are naturally occurring substances that consist of amino acids. They are essential components of all living organisms and vary from the other macronutrients in that they contain nitrogen, uh, which fats and carbohydrates do not. Proteins are classified as essential or non-essential. As with the fatty acids, essential amino acids are those that the body cannot supply. So we have to eat food to get these. Complete carbohydrates or complete proteins contain all nine of the essential amino acids and are found in animal products such as meat, poultry, fish, milk, eggs, and cheese. Incomplete proteins do not contain all essential amino acids in the quantities necessary to support growth and development. Incomplete proteins are found in legumes, nuts, grains, cereals, and vegetables. Incomplete proteins can be combined in the diet or augmented by complementary food items to equal a complete protein. For example, rice, um, uh, but, uh, and some up like dry beans. Uh, but brown rice is better for you than white rice. It doesn't have the, um, as much sugar in it as white rice does. Dry beans also contain smaller amounts of certain essential amino acids that can be found in larger amounts in rice. Together, these two foods can provide all the essential amino acids the body needs. So good sources of amino acids, they are beans and rice. Proteins perform many essential functions in the body. They build tissues, muscles, red blood cells, enzymes, and antibodies. They respond to energy to help prevent blood loss by blood clotting. They form hormones and help maintain fluid and electrolyte and acid-base balance. 
They also serve as energy source, supplying four kilograms uh, kilocalorie per gram. The recommended daily intake of protein is 56 grams for men and 45 for women. In healthy people with adequate caloric intake, the rates of protein synthesis and protein breakdown and loss are equal. If the breakdown and loss of the proteins exceeds intake, then you get a negative nitrogen balance and it can lead to metabolic complications. Excessive protein breakdown or loss may occur with burns, major illnesses, or altered emotional uh, states. Protein deficits, deficits are manifested by weight loss, tissue wasting, edema, and anemia. And you'll see that their muscles look like they're just wasting away. Children with severe protein deficiency can develop um, uh, marasmus and quercicor. Marasmus is characterized by general nutrition and is manifested by wasting of subcutaneous tissue and muscle and fat. Children with uh, marasmus appear wrinkled. Uh, quercicor core is due to protein deficiency with an adequate caloric intake. You see edema, primary abdominal ascites, and dermatitis. And I, I didn't pronounce those exactly correctly. Um, when protein intake exceeds breakdown, a positive nitrogen balance occurs. This is normal during growth, tissue repair, and pregnancy. Excessive intake of proteins may affect the rate of protein use as may taking antibiotic steroids. Abnormal rates of protein use may also occur during times of stress. When the body releases adrenal uh, corticosteroids to increase protein breakdown and conversion of amino acids to glucose, excessive intake of proteins may lead to obesity and have a significant impact on your body systems. So proteins play a big role. Um, so the next section is our vitamins. So what do vitamins do? Uh, they are involved in regulating body functions. With the exception of vitamin D and K, they must be consumed as part of the dietary intake. Vitamin D is manufactured by ultraviolet um, irradiation of cholesterol molecules in the skin. So we get out in the sun, we get some vitamin D. Um, and vitamin K is synthesized by bacteria in the intestines. Vitamins are categorized as either fat or water soluble. The fat-soluble vitamins A, D, E, and K are found in fats and oils and foods and require bile for absorption. These vitamins are stored in the liver and tissues until needed by the body. So if you have any liver damage, you may have issues with these vitamins. The storage ability also allows toxicities to develop if taken in excess. If you are eating a healthy diet, you really don't need to take any vitamin supplements because you, you get it from the food. It's naturally in the food and you can get toxic from taking too many vitamins and it can cause neurological damage and uh, uh, issues with your liver function. Any interruption of fat absorption can directly affect levels of fat soluble vitamins. Vitamins have different roles and effects of the body. The fat soluble vitamin D plays a role in calcium absorption and transport. So if you don't have enough vitamin D, your body's not going to, you have to have vitamin D for your body to absorb calcium. And you can take calcium supplements all you want to, but if you don't have enough vitamin D, it's not going to absorb. The water soluble vitamins B, complex, and C are absorbed with water in the GI tract. Vitamin B12 must become attached to the intrinsic factor, a glycoprotein, to be absorbed. If you, if you have decreased Vitamin B12, you're going to have a condition called pernicious anemia. B12 is absorbed through the gut, and if you have pernicious anemia, you have to take a B12 injection once a month. Um, I have B12 uh, deficiency, and I have to take a B12 injection uh, every month. I do it the first day of the month and give it to myself in the muscle in my arm. And when my levels got really low, I had extreme neurological side effects, leg cramps, and, and just uh, neurological irritability. It was um, was very interesting experience. 
Water-soluble vitamins consumed in excess of body requirements are excreted into urine. Each of the B vitamins play a role in cellular function throughout the body. Vitamin C plays a role in tissue healing. So if you ever, you know, you got the flu or cold and they'll tell you to take some vitamin C or zinc. The most current information about the sources and functions and minimum daily recommendation intake levels for all the vitamins is on the USDA uh, website. Um, so you can look there. They have a, a plethora of things that you can look at. Minerals are salts dissolved in water and in this state carry an electrical charge and referred to as electrolytes. We have to have electrolytes to make our cells function, to make our muscles function, to make our heart beat. Minerals work with other nutrients to maintain fluid balance. The role of minerals in maintaining fluid and electrolyte balance um, uh, is imperative to making sure that our muscles and our heart and all of our, our neurological uh, neurosystem is working effectively. Uh, minerals play a role in acid-base balance. The most abundant mineral in the body is calcium, which exists in the bones and the teeth. A very small amount of calcium exists in the blood. It helps regulate metabolic functions. Calcium is constantly moving in and out of the bone, uh, dictated by the body's demand. Phosphorus plays a role in energy production and participates in the buffer system. Like vitamins, each mineral has one or more health benefits. And so uh, the USDA uh, suggests that women of childbearing age consume foods that supply heme iron and add vitamin C rich foods to facilitate iron absorption. So again, we need vitamin C to help with the iron absorption. Women should also add 400 micrograms per day of folic acid from fortified foods or supplements, especially if you are um, pregnant or trying to get pregnant. Gotta have that folic acid to help our neurological system develop correctly. Water comprises 60% of an adult's body weight and about 75% of a, an infant's body weight. Obesity decreases that. So the more body fat we have, the less water we're able to have. And water serves in these functions, uh, transports nutrients, regulates metabolic processes. It's a solvent for vitamins, minerals, glucose, and amino acids. It's a lubricant, cushion, body temperature regulator, uh, maintains blood volume and helps us with our weight um, because the more water we have, the less fat we have. When adequate water is not ingested, the body will pull from other sources, leading to increased blood viscosity. So it makes your blood thicker, which makes you more susceptible to blood clots. Retention of toxicities and waste, so you may have constipation problems. Uh, we need fluid in our bowel to help eat, get, get the waste out. The, the drier it is, the thicker it gets, and then we become constipated. Without water, an individual can live only a few days. Dehydration, regardless of cause, accounts for multiple hospitalizations and even deaths. Okay. Uh, digestion and metabolism. So digestion takes place in the mouth. The teeth food break down the salivary enzyme. It goes through the esophagus. And so we, it has a bolus. We chew it up and the saliva, uh, it, it, it makes this uh, what's called chyme. And then it goes to the stomach and then it goes to um, um, the small intestines and to the small intestines, to the large intestines. Now, as you can see here in the small intestines, this is where absorption of nutrients is, is going on. And uh, we, we gotta make sure we chew it up good to get it in that bolus so it can be absorbed. The, the, the thicker the food and it's not chewed up well, it can absorb as well. And then it goes through the large intestines and to the colon and, and rectum, and then we expel it. Um, so metabolism, this is a chemical process. It's uh, for breakdown, and uh, it lets the body use energy from the ingested food. So it breaks down our food, and it gets the energy from it. Um, the liver's prob primarily responsible for uh, breaking down your carbs, such as sugars, glucose, and it goes from glucose to energy to fatty acids. 
Um, it's also for your proteins and ammonia and urea. So as you have liver damage, your ammonia levels will go up and that's not good. It makes you confused and um, you really have a change in cognitive status. Lipids helps uh, with the bile. And so the gallbladder helps uh, send this bile to help break down the food as well. And the metabolism of all drugs, all oral drugs, um, happens uh, in the liver. So we need to have a healthy liver. And I'm going to say this right here, and you guys haven't had pharmacology yet, but when you're educating patients about medications, acetaminophen, Tylenol, uh, you can only take no more than 4,000 milligrams of Tylenol uh, in a day. And really that's on the high end uh, because uh, acetaminophen does affect the um, uh, function of the liver and it can break it down and affect it. Uh, so we need to make sure we're educating about these medicines that um, you know can really affect liver function. Liver and kidneys break down uh, medicine. Genetic considerations, um, long-term effects are not yet known uh, for like engineered crops. Um, you know, we got to feed America, and so it takes a lot of food to feed America, and so they're constantly, you know, trying to grow it as fast as they can, so there's a lot of research being done out there. Alterations and manifestations, uh, we see something called undernutrition, and your book talked about failure to thrive. Um, this is an insufficient food intake, being hungry. You see this a lot in children, and you see failure to thrive in children, um, um, uh, especially newborns or premature newborns or newborns who were born to a mom that was um, uh, uh, on uh, drugs or alcohol. You see that a lot. And it talked about in your book about different organizations that help with hunger, like UNICEF and uh, other other places, the World Health Organization. Uh, and undernutrition in uh, adolescent girls, this can lead to um, anorexia. And, you know, a lot of teenagers are pregnant, and so they need good nutrition to maintain the pregnancy. Uh, anorexia is a very severe um, emotional, uh, 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 mental illness disease, and it needs to be addressed. Individuals who are at risk are people who have chronic illnesses, the poor, the older, um, uh, people who are uh, homeless, people who are in the hospital, uh, people who have um, uh, underlying conditions already, kidney disease, liver disease, heart disease, those type of things, and of course, alcohol. Alcohol um, um, doesn't let us absorb the nutrients. And most people that when they're drinking, they don't eat. And the more they drink, the more they want to drink because it's such an addictive drug. Um, alterations and manifestations and overnutrition. There's again, uh, too much intake of refined foods, um, fats and proteins leads to obesity. And that's a big problem. Your book talked a lot about childhood obesity and children now, um, they are overeating. They're eating high caloric fast foods. Uh, fa uh, you know, don't get me wrong, not knocking fast foods, but they are high caloric, have a lot of carbs. Uh, but it's quick and easy, and some of the fast foods are cheaper than foods in the grocery store. People buy what they can afford. But another issue is sedentary lifestyle, uh, you know, constantly being on uh, um, technology uh, with your tech toys and stuff and not getting out and moving around. Uh, uh, childhood obesity is a big problem in America. And we're actually going to talk about... Um, uh, in another chapter about um, uh, obesity. Uh, so I'm just going to leave this right here. You can read that. Some of the risk factors, and I want you to look at page 992 and 993. Uh, you see the multi-system effects of undernutrition, and it affects every body system that we have. And then alterations in therapies on page 993, and I want you to read over that as well. Um, genetic considerations and risk factors. And so what are we looking at? Um, uh, you see uh, risk factors are the type of food choices. Uh, we need to know if they're allergic. And, uh, you know, like I said, children um, 
have a tendency to have allergies to peanuts and uh, milk and stuff like that. So uh, we need to ask about allergies. We need to ask about food choices. You know, what are they eating? Um, uh, uh, are they eating too much? They may need to keep a food diary, and your chapter talked about that too, also in the obesity chapter. Uh, increased obesity with age, hormone levels change, sedentary lifestyle, your body fat increases, your muscle mass decreases, and as you lose um, your heart, you lose the ability to um, um, uh, regulate your body uh, 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 functions. Um, hormones gives us energy, especially in, in you know the female population. And as we age and get to menopause, we lose that ability. Uh, concepts related to nutrition. This is on page 994, and so it talks about. Um, uh, elimination, fluids and electrolytes, metabolism, mobility, perfusion, and tissue integrity. Because, you know, with these, and, and we've already discussed this, um, people can be very susceptible to skin breakdown. Um, what are your modifiable risk factors? These are things that we can change. We can modify them. Our food choices, our portion sizes. When you feel full, stop eating. Modifications difficult for some people because they're sensitive to certain foods. They have limited income, so they buy what they can afford. Processed foods are cheaper than your organic foods. Um, what can we do as nurses? We can provide them uh, places where they can go and get proper nutrition, and maybe it, it's, it's given to them. It's, it's not um, uh, any expense to it. And then your screenings, we talk about the body mass index and screenings, and we'll talk about that in another chapter. Nursing assessment, we want to look at the common risk factors. Uh, what's their nutritional history? Do, are they keeping a, a, a nutritional diary? How much do they consume every day? What do their labs look like? Um, what's their protein levels? What's their hemoglobin levels? Um, what's their, um, um, you know, the electrolyte levels? Uh, food and drug interactions, what are your allergies? What's their health history? We want to know, you know, what's going on with them. Um, uh, have we done any anthropometric measurements, like measuring the, uh, you know, size of the muscles to see if they're appropriate or if they're wasting away? We want to do a psychosocial assessment. Um, you know, how do you feel about food? If you're obese, is food your comfort? Is it your uh, your filter? Is it your way of, um, you know, dealing with stress? And then do you have access to food? And on page 995, it talked about the mini nutritional assessment uh, tool. And it's a tool um, that uh, looks at assessment for patients in the community or the healthcare setting. And so, um, you know, they've got tools out there to assess food intake. Uh, the Joint Commission uh, care standards require nutritional screening within 24 hours of patients being admitted to the hospital. When a patient in the hospital for more than a week, nutritional assessment should be part of their daily care. Do they need weights every day? Do they need, um, you know, do they need a dietary consult? Okay. So when we're looking at observation and the patient interview, uh, we want to look at the initial assessment. They need to be assessed on admission. Signs for malnutrition, their muscles are wasting, they're underweight, they're very bony, they've got pressure ulcers or pressure injuries is the new term. Uh, we want to measure their height, their weight, and compare it to the normal levels of someone who is, is healthy. What is their eating habit? Can they chew? And one thing that inhibits chewing is dentures. Do they have cavities? Do they have teeth? Do they have broken teeth? Do they have dentures? Are they fitting? Do they um, uh, uh, give them the chance to chew appropriately? The uh, history, uh, uh, current nutritional intake, your lifestyle. Uh, do you exercise? Do you, you know, do anything? You know, are you sedentary? The physical exam, we want to look at the anthropometric measurements. You're looking at the height, weight, your body mass index, and your book talks about in the obesity chapter, um, any the body mass index being greater than 30, you're considered obese at that point. 
And so your body mass index is according to your height. So someone like me, I'm overweight. Um, I've lost 30 pounds since last March, but I still need to lose more from my height. I'm considered overweight. And we look at waist to hip circumference, skin folds, um, look at, um, you know, the amount of, of adipose tissue on, on the body. Many cultures recognize both acceptable and prohib prohibitive food choices. So when you're dealing with culture, it lists some of the cultures here. Uh, they, some cultures don't like slaughtered meat or butchered meat or has to be cooked a certain way. So you need to know what their cultural preferences are. Diagnostic tests, we're looking at the lipid profile, CBC, their glucose levels, your albumin, which is indicative of li your liver, and your protein, and of course, let cholesterol. And you need to know this, 160 to 200 is considered a good cholesterol range. Uh, independent interventions. Uh, nurses play a pivotal role in education about your food choices. Uh, we will be educating patients. Um, we will supply them with information and we will do it in conjunction with the dietitian, you know, uh, you know, give them um, uh, handouts that show what good food intake is and help them find the resources to find it. Again, this day and time, it's very difficult because um, we, you know, things are just getting more and more costly. Um, Healthy People 2020, healthcare providers give patients more comprehensive info about weight status, so we're required to do that. Um, we uh, look at their weights and we do a diet evaluation and nutritional counseling with the dietitian as well. Collaborative therapies, one thing um, that it brought out in this on page 999, it talks about your dietitians and your nutritionist. It said patients with diabetes should be referred to a diabetes nurse educator and patients with advanced cardiovascular risk should be referred to a cardiac rehab center because these places specifically focus on diabetes or cardiac and they really focus on the diets that are specific for those um, situations. Bariatric surgeries, uh, this is where, um, you know, they go in and they do a reduction of your uh, stomach too, so you can um, eat less. Uh, look on page uh, 1000 and 1001. Uh, it talks about the different kinds of medications, uh, lipase inhibitors, anorexics, uh, vitamin supplements, mineral supplements. Um, please review that, okay? I'm at almost an hour now with this presentation. I don't want it to be uh, too long for you to listen to. Um, look on page 1001. It says excess consumption of some vitamins, especially the fat-soluble vitamins, can lead to significant toxicity. And it said that before. The disorder is referred to as hypervitaminosis. When taken in excess, vitamin D can cause bone destruction rather than bone formation. Excess intake of vitamin C can lead to diarrhea, nausea, and stomach cramps, which can lead to dehydration. Uh, pharmacological therapies, again, there's medications listed on page 1,000, um, vitamins, minerals, protein drinks, powders, but you shouldn't be doing these unless you consult with your physician first. Non-pharmacological therapies, losing weight, uh, changing your diet, exercising, um, maintaining that, uh, replacing um, high calorie foods with fruit, more fruits and vegetables, okay? Um, special diets, um, and we talked about um, some special diets, um, the vegan diets and stuff like that, uh, but those diets, they need nutrients with those. Um, you may be on an ADA diet, which is for diabetics. You may be on a low sodium diet, which is for your cardiac patients. Um, it just all depends on what the physician orders. Um, on page 1002, it lists some special diets for you, gluten-free, low sodium, low protein. And then it also talks about total uh, uh, perennial nutrition. And this is where you have to have nutrition IV. And it gives you carbs, fats, and electrolytes. And these are for people who um, have had um, trauma, uh, they can't eat, burns, um, 
uh, for some reason they just they're just not able to eat and you have to do the TPN is what we call it. Uh, nutrition for infants uh, is they're rapidly growing and so they need their, their weight doubles or triples during the first year and so they need um, nutrition they need adequate intake for bone formation teeth development um, breastfeeding is best because it gives them the antibodies to help fight off infection and so they may be able to be referred to a lactate um, lactation consultant um, nutrition for children, um, uh, half of what is on the plates, fruits and vegetables, lean meats, whole grains. And, and of course, you're looking at this list and you're like, kids don't like none of this. Yeah, they like junk food and stuff like that. Um, but we have to, if you start them out right and they don't know any better, that's what they'll eat. My grandchildren love fruits and vegetables because my daughter hardly ever gives them any sugar. Uh, nutrition for adolescents. Um, you know, your body is rapidly changing, especially going through puberty, and so they need protein, calcium, iron. Um, their bones are growing at a faster rate. They have those growth spurts, and they're, but they're very picky about their food, so we have to educate them. And another thing, uh, when we talked about diabetes and talked about juvenile diabetes, um, you know, it's very hard for these uh, kids to change their diet, very hard. Nutrition uh, for your adolescents, um, again, social pressures to be thin. Um, we really uh, may need to refer them to some psychiatric counseling if they're dealing with, with that. And, uh, pressure on males to gain uh, muscle mass and on the females to be thin. Um, obesity, these kids a lot of times get labeled and they get picked on. And so they deal with a lot of depression and obesity in children leads to type 2 diabetes, hypertension, poor self-esteem. And so, uh, you know, now you're dealing not just with a dietary issue, but with a mental issue as well. Again, nutrition for pregnant women, folic acid, uh, more protein, iron, calcium, and an immoderate weight gain, just not over weight gain. Uh, nutrition for adults, um, lower the high calories, uh, make sure they're eating, you know, stuff that's got the vitamins in it, you know, proteins, lean, lean meats, grains, fruits, vegetables, um, those type of things, things that have the, the B vitamins in it. Um, obesity is a concern among the older population, too, because they um, can be sedentary. As you get older, you lose energy. And so um, there's a good teaching plan on page 1004 and a wonderful care plan on page 1005. I would read over that. Um, again, the obesity can occur in the older adult because of sedentary lifestyle or the lack of being able to buy food that is, um, uh, you know, lowering calories. Like I said, processed foods are uh, cheaper. Um, it leads to heart disease, diabetes, and musculoskeletal issues. The more weight you gain, the more problems you're going to have with your skeletal structure. You're going to have pain in your knees and hips. Um, some of, uh, older adults are undernourished. They live alone. They don't have anybody to care for them. Um, they uh, may not be able to get fluids if they're thirsty or they have poor teeth. They have um, uh, zero uh, xerostomia, which is decreased salivation. That's on page 1004. They lose their taste buds. Um, taste is different. And one of the thing, one of the last taste sensations is sweets. So they, all they want is sweets. They may be thirsty. They may be dehydrated and they may can't tell you. Maybe they've had a stroke or something. It leads to constipation, um, polypharmacy using different, um, pharmacies and different types of medications. Um, people who live alone are very susceptible if they're not um, able to function independently.